Uh, good afternoon, members, uh, and welcome to this, the meeting of the Licensing and General Purposes Committee on Wednesday, the 20th of October, 1921. Uh, may start with the first item on the agenda. Apologies for absence. Oh, uh, yes, Chairman. Apologies, Councillor Anthony Betty, Polly Costello, Will Human, and Stuart Kingham. Any others? Take then, take then item two, which is urgent business. Is there any? There's none, Chairman. So we go to item three with public speaking time. Do we have any public speaking? No members of the public have registered to speak. Uh, take item four, declaration of interest. Are there any declaration of interest of items on the agenda? No? Right, we'll then move to item five which is the Contaminated Land Strategy 2022-2027. Uh, Nicola is going to lead us on this. So it's over to you, Nicola. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Can you all hear me? Yeah. Great. Yeah. OK, that's good. Um, so um, the purpose of the report really was to seek approval for the draft Contaminated Land Strategy to go through to public consultation uh, and then subsequently, after any comments are received, to come back to this committee for approval by full council. Um, just as, as background, uh, you should, obviously you've got the report. You should also have as Appendix 1 the actual draft strategy. Uh, if there's anybody that hasn't, do let me know because I might uh, refer you to it. Looks like everybody's got Appendix 1 too. That's good. Um, just as background, uh, the local authority and specifically Environmental Health uh, are the regulator for contaminated land. Um, and by contaminated land, uh, you, you're probably aware, it means things where there will have been a contaminative use. So say uh, landfill sites, um, quarries, petrol stations, um, incinerators, factories, all sorts of contaminative use. And historically, we weren't very good at cleaning up afterwards. And so plenty of land uh, across nationally and locally uh, has got some sort of contamination in it. Um, and you're talking about things like hydrocarbons, acids, alkalis, explosive gases, all sort of manner of things, really. Um, and and so obviously failure to um, deal with contaminated land can have very um, serious consequences for both human health uh, and the environment. Uh, and those are all set out in the um, contaminated land strategy as background. Um, since uh, 2001, which is the current strategy, things have moved on a lot. Um, and there's been a significant change nationally, really, in the way in which local authorities deal with contaminated land. So previously we might have gone out and identified sites and actively looked for them uh, and then risk assessed them and prioritised them. Um, but there's been a significant change and it's what's called more of a strategic approach where we would deal with them basically through the planning development process. So that, that so several needs really to um, update this strategy. One is very, very old and there's been, and secondly, there's been significant changes in the way in which we deal with uh, contaminated land. I just thought it might be useful to have a look at some of the sites that environmental health have um, overseen in the last sort of five, six years. So um, they're listed in the, in the report itself, but if, uh, if you've got access to the strategy itself on page 35, um, there's some lovely pictures and that's perhaps the most interesting bit of the strategy is the photographs of some of the sites that we have um, remediated. Um, so if you want to have a look at page 35 onwards in the uh, contaminated land strategy, but um, there are sites such as the Sedgemoor Splash site, uh, which is uh, currently being changed into uh, a mixed use site, including cinema, shops uh, and a school, which is already there. Um, what I think the BAE system site, I think that might be the biggest brownfield site in the UK, or, or if not, it's certainly in the southwest. Um, so that's now what's called gravity. And there were um, there was a lot of contamination on that site because there was a lot of explosives uh, uh, made there. And so those explosive residues were left. And so we've 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 gone through the um, investigative process and then remediation process with uh, the owners of that site. 
So you can see that there's quite a lot of um, biggish sites there, many of which have, are now being changed into residential use. Um, so hopefully some interesting sites that are now, you know, being able to be used again. Um, so the statutory guidance which is there uh, requires us, as I said, to have an up-to-date contaminated land strategy. Um, I've explained about the change in, of approach. Um, there's a, a couple of principles that still apply, and those are that the polluter pays, so that, 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 that's still in place, and also that um, the site must be suitable for its use. So, for example, you might have um, a car park that's got uh, a tarmac top to it, and underneath there might be quite a lot of contamination, but actually if it's topped off with tarmac, then it's, it's still suitable for use. So that's an example of that. Um, and so, so really just the, the report explains that the way in which we deal with contaminated land now is through the planning development process. So that would probably be at least 95% of our cases. Um, and it allows you know, when an application comes in, if we think it's there's some contaminative previous use, then we can ask for an investigation. We can uh, review the report that gets sent in and make sure that the remediation happens as, as happened with the sites that I've just um, run through with you. There are a few times that you get accidents, you know, leaks of oils, chemicals, etc. And in those cases, then we would deal with those reactively um, and uh, it may ideally you know, on a voluntary basis. Um, but we do have enforcement powers that we can use if we need to. Um, at the, uh, the contaminated land strategy, uh, the guidance says specific things have to be in there. So it's got to be local, it's got to be related to Sedgemoor and the geology and contaminative uses. Um, and the aims and objectives need to tie in with our corporate themes, which uh, I believe they do. Um, and it also, it's, we, we are required to put in how remediation will take place um, and being mindful of the cost of that as well. So. Um, Having done some consultation internally, there's no extra implications uh, from a finance basis or from staffing, equality, risk management, and um, the legal team, thank you, have confirmed that we do have a statutory duty to deal with contaminated land in this way and have a strategy. Um, so, so really, the, the, the options for you today are to uh, approve the strategy as it is, uh, or if there's any amendments, option two, any amendments to it, then um, that's option two. Uh, and my recommendation is that the strategy is approved, ready to go out for consultation. So I don't know if there's any questions on any of that. Do any members have any questions on it? Councillor Richard. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I hope you don't think I'm going to be picky here, uh, Nicola, but can I just refer to the section that describes the background um, to the geology of the area, specifically on page 29, and the few sentences about the historic contamination from the mining, from the zinc mining in Chipham Robra and, and Star. Um, it, it is absolutely clear from um, ongoing studies particularly the work from Imperial College published in 2000, that, that, they, that there's no clear evidence of health effects of the very high levels of cadmium, which are about 300 parts per million in a lot of people's gardens um, in, in, in the parish, which are extraordinarily high. And there have been these good longitudinal studies since the contamination came to light right up to 1997, looking at incidences of of cancer and other and, and excess mortalities compared with, with with the control village. But I think it would be good in this paragraph to actually cite some evidence because because here it says very clearly a study found that the cadmium in the soil is tightly bound up in minerals and is not readily available for uptake uptake by plants. Now if that is a study that was done with cadmium in the soil in Shipham, then we should reference it because there are plenty of um, reports in the literature of how cadmium is very clearly taken up and accumulated by plants across a range of soil types. And I can pass you on the, um, the, the, the references. So I think we ought to be very careful about that. And also saying 
therefore it does not enter the food chain and has no measurable effect on health. Because again, there are a number of reports in the literature of the effect of cadmium from the food chain um, affecting health. Recent studies across Australia showing the use of uh, sewage um, sludges and other domestic wastes on land contributing cadmium that's taken up by crops. So I think we really need to um, be fairly tight on the wording so that so that we're, we're not open for saying, oh, the cadmium in the soil is not a problem. Um, as I say, I, I don't see it as a big problem, but I just do think that we need to get this right. In the past, I'm not quite sure what planning control, what planning and development control does now, but um, there has been um, a, a sort of condition often applied to plans in Shipham that if when you're digging out footings from, from um, development, when you're putting extensions on houses or building new houses, you have to be careful what you do with that soil. So if we're saying here in, in this paragraph that the cadmium is bound tightly to the soil and isn't taken up by plants and, and doesn't go into the food chain, then development control wouldn't have to worry about that and wouldn't have to refer environmental health to, to look at planning applications from that point of view in the parish. So I, I think I'm just looking for tightening up the wording here, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Richards. Uh, <laughs> Hello, I'm sorry, was that Councillor Richards? I didn't quite catch yes. the name. Yes, that's correct. Yes. Yes. Councillor Richards. Richards. Yeah, thank you for that. I think you're probably right when we make reference to a study. Uh, I think that probably was the uh, local study that was done, that which was before my time and uh, I think was probably in the original contaminated land strategy or the current one. So um, yeah, well, I'm happy to have a look at that and see if we can tighten up the wording on that and make sure that that is completely right and, and have some reference to any sort of um, research studies that have been done. And I think that is a reference to the local study. Um, so yeah, and, and in terms of the um, the reference with planning, I think maybe it's an inf informative that is put on. Uh, I'm not sure whether anything goes on as a condition at the moment for uh, that particular area in Shipham, um, but I can find out about that uh, and happy to have a look at the wording of that and just tighten it up, as you say, a little bit. Is, is that OK? Yes, absolutely. And um, I can leave the references with Steve to pass on to you. Thank you. Uh, yes, Councillor Pierce. Thank you. Um, and thank you for the, the draft strategy. It's really comprehensive and I, I haven't got any um, any questions about the strategy itself, except for sort of in an ongoing way, because you mentioned that it was some time before the um, existing strategies in place and now it's been sort of revised and updated if I've understood that correctly. I just wondered about capacity to, to review things ongoing because legislation potentially will be changing quickly and I'm just thinking of climate change and all of, all of that and I just wondered um, about once this, this strategy is adopted the capacity then to then review as required by changing legislation? Well, you're, you're right in that it, this current strategy has been in place a long time and probably too long. Um, going forward, we're, we're heading towards a, a unitary situation. And I suppose I, I might have mentioned the timing of doing this actually, um, but it, it is a statutory duty to do it and review it fairly regularly. Um, and so I think we started this work just before the couple of years before the pandemic, uh, then everything went on hold, um, but we still wanted to then get back to it. So we don't know quite when all our services will, will align with the unitary situation, but I think at least we'll be in a good position because we'll have a, an up, the most up to date strategy and it could act as a good template for across the county when there will have to be a county wide uh, strategy. Um, as to resources and ability to do that, it's it's a sort of proactive thing. And I work in a team where there's a lot of reactive work. And so it's quite difficult sometimes to balance that reactive work with proactive. But um, it's certainly on our, you know, top of our agenda at the moment. And we would hope to end up with an up-to-date strategy that uh, reflects Sedgemoor. 
Um, so I don't know if that answers your question. Thank you. It, it does raise another one that I hadn't thought of before was about the other district strategies. Are they, um, I'm assuming they're sort of more or less in line or are, are you aware of any changes which could cause a, a, a difficulty as we do move to unitary? Um, I think I don't know them in detail, but what I would say is that the statutory guidance is quite specific about what you have to put into a strategy. I, I mentioned a few of the things you've got to reflect your local circumstances. And um, I don't think we would have really differing um, circumstances in terms of contaminated land. Um, so, so I think it has helped that, you know, the statutory guidance is fairly clear about what must go into a strategy. Uh, and then it's a case of comparing our own local uh, geology and contaminative uses. And I don't know that they would be that different, uh, probably. Is there any, further, any further questions no, from, from Cathy? So can I propose then that this document goes out for consultation with the amendments as proposed by Council Riches, uh, and in which case I'll put it to the vote. In favour? Against? Abstentions? I'll take it. We have a proposed and second. We have a proposed and second, I presume. So we, we've got, who's got a proposed? That's Councillor fine. Richards has proposed it and Councillor Pierce has seconded it. That's fine, thank okay, you. Okay, sorry about that. <laughs> Get your name on it. Get your name in a minute. <laughs> thank you so much indeed for that. Sir. I appreciate your input into the meeting and I think as you said we will have the most up-to-date strategy of all the four local councils and I think uh, we might once again lead the way so let's that's the case. <laughs> we will indeed if there's any questions any time you're very welcome to um, come and ask me okay thank, thank you. you so much once again for doing it and all the work on it thank you so much thank you thank you bye-bye right so we'll move into item six which is the gambling policy for 22 25 and Alan is leading on this one. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, good afternoon, members. Uh, the matter before you today is obviously the return of a policy. Uh, the Council's policy in gambling is due for its mandatory three year review in accordance with the Gambling Act. And if you recall, the draft policy was brought before you in July for consideration and has since been subject to a period of formal consultation of 10 weeks, which ended on the 1st of October. The results of the consultation are now brought back before committee for final consideration in advance of adoption by full council ahead of the required publication date in January 22. Um, so you are duly invited to consider the report, the draft policy and the consultation responses before making any appropriate changes ahead of referral to full council. Um, in terms of revising the statement of policy, I'd just like to remind you we have taken into account the Gambling Commission's guidance to licensing authorities, which is a sixth edition, which was earlier this year, the relevant legislation and, of course, the existing policy. We've ensured that the revised policy takes into account current developments in the approach to gambling regulation, as well as the potential outcomes of the forthcoming gambling review. The revised policy, we feel, therefore, reflects it in future the Gambling Commission will focus on operators and issues of national significance, online gambling being the prime example, with licensing authorities taking the lead on regulating gambling locally. So premises based and, and as you're aware, permit based. Uh, we've also taken into account the experience of officer led inspections of gambling premises, which will be pleased to know have started again within the district with regards to licenses and or permits. It's strongly recommended that changes are required, as we've already stated in the first meeting, in order for the policy to remain robust and fit for purpose in light of the Gambling Commission's license conditions and codes of practice. We also said, if you recall at the time, I think that we would like it to become more of a signposting policy for businesses so that anybody that really seeks to have a premises in our district can look at the policy and actually then make some decisions based on what we're recommending. Um, and I think that will be relevant to bear that in mind, maybe when considering some of the consultation responses. Um, you will see attached to your report the draft policy. 
um, initially approved by your good sales in July, is shown as Appendix A. A list of responses, including some minor or brief amendments, are included in Appendix B, and a specific consultation response from the Somerset Safeguarding Children Partnership is shown in Appendix C. Appendix D contains a response from Goss Chalk Solicitors on behalf of the Betting and Gaming Council, whilst Appendices E and F contain responses by another solicitor, Popleston Allen, on behalf of Power Leisure Bookmakers and Merker Slots UK Limited, respectively. Um, good news for members is we don't have to consider them separately. They are, in fact, the same document uh, and are representing two different um, operators. Obviously, you've got Paddy Power, essentially, with the betting shops and Merker Slots and Bingo, who predominantly one of the high street names that used to be linked uh, along those lines was Casino, as I'm sure you've probably seen in the district. There are no identified quality implications in connection with the report. As you will know, vulnerable groups have been identified within the Gambling Act with specific reference to the licensing objective, which of course is protecting children and other vulnerable persons from being harmed or exploited by gambling. Again, we need to bear that in mind, I think, on some of the consultation responses. Um, the options before you simply to consider the draft policy and, if appropriate, make any changes with regard to responses received, received as part of the full consultation process. Um, I mentioned the signposting and the link to the corporate priorities, I think, is the adoption of an updated policy will ensure that gambling activities within the district are fully regulated. But there is also the opportunity to li liaise with proprietors to ensure that responsible and compliant operators are able to develop and grow their business, particularly uh, in terms of the economic recovery from the pandemic. Um, you will note the finance comments, uh, legal comments and health and well-being comments. Uh, again, in terms of signposting, uh, if I can refer briefly to the economic development implications, and it does say clearly defined guidance within the policy will enable operators to effectively judge what will be required of them should they open new premises within Sedgemont. Existing operators within the district will also have the time to adapt their current business and processes to meet any changes specified within the document as part of the consultation process, which is gone, hopefully allowing compliant operators to continue to develop and grow their businesses. So again, we feel that is the impact upon signposting within the policy. So it is for the, obviously for the committee to consider the draft policy and make any, any changes deemed appropriate. Um, if I can refer you to begin with, rather than to Appendix A, because that is the, the policy we already have drafted in July, my intention really is to go through the consultation responses and pick out the points made and give you the opportunity to comment on each one following a recommendation from, from the officers. Um, my colleague Richard Noakes is also on the call remotely who put a lot of hard work into revising this, and it's essentially his recommendations too in respect of this. Um, he has a lot of experience in gambling-based environments with the Gambling Commission. Um, so to begin with, if I could refer you all to Appendix B, um, as you will see from that document, uh, the initial paragraphs give you an idea of some of the responses we've had that didn't actually make uh, any recommendations for change. I think we can get through points one on two on that pretty quickly in terms of that I recommend that they are just changes that are uh, automatic, if you like. Uh, um, HM Revenues and Customs have updated their details and you will see that Christy Blackwell has also uh, corrected the title for what is now Somerset Safeguarding Children Partnership. So I propose that we just go, go through those as read, Mr Chairman. Great. Okay, thank you. Um, the third one is from us as a licensing team. If you recall, um, we made a change last time, particularly in relation to unlicensed family entertainment centres. So we're talking about the kiddies arcades effectively where the category D games are played by children. And it was recommended that enhanced DVS checks are carried out on all of the staff. During the consultation period, discussions were held with licensing practitioners concerning matters of policy because many policies are up for grabs at the moment because it's a three yearly cycle. 
So a lot of other authorities are in the position where they're reviewing their policies. And one of the issues that came up was the issue of DBS. Um, and it appears that we have put ourselves in a position, if that goes through currently worded, that we will place operators in a position where they would have to ask for DBS checks that they can't possibly get. Because the role of people within an unlicensed family entertainment centre does not qualify for an enhanced DBS check. So they would erroneously apply for one and in all likelihood DBS will go no, bounce it back. So we're putting them in a position I think where they can't possibly achieve what we're asking them to do in policy. So what we've said um, is that we recommend maybe that that's changed to reflect an element of future proofing because if that changes we will clearly maybe want to consider that but also secondly we don't want to be in a position where our policy is erroneous and at worst subject possibly to judicial review so our recommendation is i think um, that we replace the enhanced the line enhanced criminal checks have been completed for all staff to the applicant will be expected to provide evidence that a suitable criminal record check with the disclosure and barring service has been conducted on all staff in their employment and that's our strong recommendation mr chairman thank you thank you okay um so any questions on that point before that was okay thank you chairman um thank you for talking through that because I can remember C Councillor Cordner making the point at the last yeah. meeting that, you know, in schools and, and centres of education where children are, the requirements for DBS checks um, are so strict, quite rightly, and here we are. Um, and I, I understand what you're, you're saying. You can't ask for something that isn't possible. Mm -hmm. But I just wonder where it says in the proposed wording, um, the applicants will be expected to provide evidence that are suitable criminal record yep. check um, with the DBS. Is, is, a, is it possible to put something very specific in there for operators so they're under no illusion that they are expected to, um, it just, the word suitable hmm. sounds um, a bit vague to me, but maybe it's because I don't know enough about the system. No, that's no problem. We didn't either, which is why we had to look it up, <laughs> to be fair. Um, yeah, no, the way I understand it is that when you ask for a check, you've got um, you've got an enhanced DBS check, you've got a standard DBS check, and you've got the basic one. Now, there are specific guidelines that I think I've mentioned somewhere, the uh, yeah, Rehabilitation of Offenders Act and a lot of other stuff that's on that on that list. And that clearly defines what roles can be had. I think the difference is, and you kind of touched on it, is that if you're working specifically with children in a role in a school, in a, in a nursery, that kind of thing, then yes, that role would apply. The other way of looking at it is in an unlicensed family entertainment centre, maybe staff will be away from the floor. Um, maybe those that are on the floor, if you like, it's almost similar to a shop because a retail shop will have children coming in inevitably. So will an unlicensed family entertainment centre. That's where the role falls outside uh, rather than the specific role. I think that the purpose, to answer your second point really, of making it um, <clears throat> a little bit vague is it's kind of a catch-all because we can at any one time say to a, if it changes, and that's the key with this, I think. We can go out under inspection and say the suitable criminal record check is now basic, standard or enhanced. That means you have to comply with it because that says so in the policy. I think if we're too specific and something changes, we might find we have to alter it again. Oh, okay. Um, I don't know if that helped. Sorry. Yes, it does. <coughs> Thank you. I believe our solicitor would like to make a few yep. comments, if you may. Um, yeah, thanks, Chairman. I was just going to say the only one that we would be able to insist on is a basic one because that's the only one where you don't need any um, eligibility criteria. You do for the um, both the standard and the enhanced, and um, the family entertainment centre wouldn't fit the criteria. So, um, but like I said, what Mr. Weldon is saying is if, if the legislation was to change and we had the word basic in there, yeah. effectively the policy would be out of date almost. Yes, okay. Yeah, thank you. I accept that. Are you happy with yes. the answers? Yes, right? thank, you. yes. thank you. Any further, sorry, any further questions for Alan before he proceeds? 
Okay. Thank you. Carry on, Alan. Thank you. Um, you'll see actually that now we're going to different appendices. Um, I think the meat on the bones will be D and E, but we'll start with C, uh, which if I can refer you to the Somerset Safeguarding Children Partnership. We were very pleased to get a, if I can find it, <laughs> there we go, a response from them uh, in terms of correcting, as it says, uh, the name of the, 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 the responsible partnership now, which we'll, we'll do anyway. Um, and I, I just recommend really that we just accept their uh, referral as it stands. I think it's important that they want us to put in to the list of local strategies and policies. And I'm pleased to get an update on that. The Somerset Plan for Children, Young People and Their Families. Um, and also their amendment to paragraph 7.9. Um, advisory body for the protection of children from harm and I think the wording we just adopt on block with a helpful link actually which we've also tried to make this year with the policy in putting links into the policy so people can refer to it which hasn't happened before so my proposal on that Mr Chairman if accepted is that we just accept that one as is read thank you does anybody have any comments or remarks to make to Alan on that subject no, no, so I think so we're happy with that one, Alan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, if I can call up these documents now, if I can refer you first of all to Appendix D. And just a reminder, really, this is Goss Chalk Solicitor. So part of the consultation process is we sent uh, a copy of the policy to a number of solicitors that deal with us on a, on a weekly basis. So the two that have responded, first Goss Chalk, then Popst and Alan, are heavily involved in licensing work. So it's good to get um, responses from them. Now, you'll see actually that we don't really get going on specific references on Goss Chalks halfway down page four. But I think the first three pages of the response introduces the Betting and Gaming Council, moves on to summarise the position regarding betting and gaming in the UK before touching on the subject of problem gambling, which of course is a very topical, topical issue. Um, my view is it's a useful summary, especially for committee members, because I am aware sometimes that the more negative aspects of gambling are brought before you. For example, occasionally you'll quite rightly receive a presentation from bodies such as Gam Care or Gamble Aware. And many of you will recall the betting shops fixed odds betting terminal issue in recent years. <clears throat> Excuse me. When we were asked to make comment in response to government led consultation. Um, so I think it's good sometimes that you get a report that actually says this is why we're here. Um, having reviewed these summaries, I think Goss Chalks do make a case of balance, therefore, regarding the benefits of the gambling and gaming industry as a legitimate and safe pastime for the majority of users. They also make reference to a possible decline in problem gambling, but I would say that shouldn't mean that we as regulators should take our eye off the ball when specifying certain requirements within our gambling policy. Um, the bottom of page three, going into page four, make a point of drawing our attention to the differences regarding the use of license conditions from those premises licensed in accordance with the Licensing Act and the Gambling Act. I can reassure you that we're fully aware of these differences, and I do not believe that our policy does encourage the use of license conditions in the way that they fear. These are matters that rightly would need to be considered on each individual application and or premises. Um, and I think the, the crux of their point is, as you're aware, for those of you who have been on subcommittee hearings, is that conditions are used very often in licensing app premises for alcohol and entertainment and quite often are agreed with the applicant through their operating schedule. Whereas in gambling, the mandatory and default conditions that are already specified are nearly always enough to um, apply to a license. And they're making that point. Um, we will go on to talk about, about conditions. Uh, moving on to the specific comments uh, or their specific comments on the draft policy. It starts halfway down page four. Uh, um, considerations specific to the draft statement of policy 22 to 25. Um, now, I think they, they're referring to paragraph 4.3 of Appendix A. Sorry, we are dropping about here, but I'll try and explain it without you needing to keep going backwards and forwards. Um, what they're saying, I think, is that paragraph 4.3 location refers to the potential for a policy as regards areas where premises should not be located. 
uh, suggesting references to any such policy should be deleted. Any policy with grant areas where gambling premises should not be located is likely to be unlawful and certainly contrary to the aim to permit principle within section 153 of the Gambling Act. And it is true to say that we do have the aim to permit gambling to take place when we look at applications. That's the ethos of the Act. Um, it also carries on then, as you can see, to then mention draft statement of policy should be clear that the mere proximity of any other matters listed in the bullet points that are there would not mean that an application would be refused. So kind of our response to that is on reflection, we do think, as I say, that Goss Chalks have a point here regarding the aim to permit principle. I therefore recommend that to you that the wording the council will have regard to any further guidance as regard areas where gambling premises should not be located is replaced with the council will have regard to any wider issues in areas where gambling premises are situated. I don't think it's for us to say thou shalt not have one here. And kind of the wording does imply that, and I think they're right. So for that reason, I think we should change that wording. Um, and, and to add to that, we do not, however, recommend changing any of the bullet points because they do simply set out the considerations that the council may take into account, thereby clarifying the position for any applicants, which is part of the signposting that we talked about earlier. So just so to summarise, I don't recommend changing the bullet points, but I think that extra sentence does clarify the position if you approve that. Thank you. Uh, any questions for Alan on that particular point? Now, Alan, they seem quite happy with that uh, alteration to the policy. Thank you. Uh, yes, there's the, the next thing I think we're talking about is paragraph 4.5, uh, which explains the licensing authority's approach to local area risk assessments. They're often referred to as LARA, so forgive me, because I've got LARA written down a lot of time here. I thought I'd explain what I'm bound to say at some point. Um, they are arguing there's a list of bullet points detailing matters that the council consider to signify changes uh, and which would therefore require an up-to-date risk assessment, uh, suggesting that a lot of what we've said wouldn't have an impact on the licensing objectives and maybe should be reconsidered. And um, I think what they're saying is this section is over prescriptive and should be abridged. Um, our view is that officers fundamentally disagree with this assessment for a number of reasons. Firstly, an effective and he said, Lara, local area risk assessment is the main tool available to us to ensure that premises that are already licensed undertake and just as importantly maintain a robust risk assessment regarding the premises itself and specifically in relation to the community in which it's situated. Kind of explains that really. Secondly, the effective signposting of expectations within the policy document clarify the position for any operators considering the submission of a new application. It's there, they know what they've got to look for. Furthermore, it was clear that um, Richard Noakes, my colleague who's also on the call here, uh, specified that he was involved a lot at the point when Lara's were brought in and uh, premises operators said to us, what do we do? There's no other indication. The Gambling Commission don't give us an indication. Um, there's nothing else out there. So it's fundamentally for us to point out what they need to put in their risk assessments, or at least consider rather than put the, the items that they need to consider. So it was clear when these were first introduced that very few operators knew what should be included within Alara, and it was left to councils to respond. So it is therefore very important in our view that the section remains as detailed as possible. Finally, Goss Chalks also state that there is no need for our requirement for operators to have an up-to-date risk assessment available on the premises. Again, we disagree and argue that it is vital that staff are trained in and fully understand the risks presented in that specific premises and outside. It makes no sense, for instance, that a national operator has the same cut and paste generic risk assessment for five shops in a district when they could each be situated in different areas and therefore present different types of risks. For these reasons, we recommend to the committee that the local area risk assessment section of the policy remains intact. Thank you. Does anybody have any comments? Councillor Richards. Yes, yes, thank you. Could you just clarify, what do they mean in that paragraph when they say it's simply 
sorry, it simply duplicates the existing ordinary code provision. What is an ordinary code? I bear with me. I think it refers to the. I'll, I'll bring Richard in in a second, but I think it, it it applies to the LCCP. So they're arguing that actually the codes of practice determine how they should operate. Uh, and part of that is that risk assessment should be undertaken. The point I think is that it's not that code that defines what we ask for, because we need to as a district, and they need to in response, look at the local areas. So very much the code doesn't crack it for a, give you an example, a betting shop in a high street with a bargain booze next door, a school over the road, um, you know, uh, uh, another risk i'm trying to think of another one college springs to mind behind it in other words they've got to look at each one but i'll read but i look that's probably a, a kind of stumbling attempt to answer that question if richard's on the call if i can bring him in for that thank you very much um yes thank you alan good afternoon everybody um the the code to which the uh, the, re the respondents refer to is actually a code within the Gambling Commission's license conditions and codes of practice. And there is a, a social responsibility code, which is a, a requirement of any uh, licensed operator to assess local risk. Um, it's not an ordinary code. Um, the ordinary code provision of, of that part of that code relates to um, licensees sharing their risk assessments with licensing authorities on request. So the actual reference is, is not actually correct from the respondent, but there is a, a requirement for all licensed operators to assess local risk. The Gambling Commission's license conditions and codes of practice are obviously are fairly generic and one size fits all. And um, it's therefore important, we feel, that, um, that uh, uh, licensees in a specific local authority area are given a steer into the expectations of that licensing authority and probably a good example would be for Sedgemore is that um, the influx of um, workers to the HPC construction facility for example in Bridgewater may have fundamentally changed the customer base of um, town centre betting shops in Bridgewater and therefore potentially contractors with um, money away from home might present a, a, an increased risk or a different risk to their established customer database. So those are the sort of things that we'd be looking at. And we feel that it is important that the licensing authority does give a very clear steer as to what our expectations are uh, that we that we expect them to consider in their premises local risk assessments. And my experience is they do vary greatly in quality. They have improved significantly since the in, since the start of the requirement, um, but in some cases there is still much more room for improvement. Thank you, Richard. Do you have anything further on that, Councillor Richard? No, thank you very much. That's very clear, and I think yeah, certainly we should be supporting the, the view taken here by the officers. Definitely. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, over to you, Alan. Any further? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, we are getting there, I promise. Um, <laughs> uh, I think the next one, if I'm right, because I've lost, yeah, here we go, paragraph 4.6. Um, and this is regarding, again, and we kind of mentioned it before, the imposition of conditions on premises. And I mentioned the difference between Licensing Act and Gambling Act. Um, the section should re reiterate the statement that's already in our policy, which acknowledges that mandatory and default default conditions are usually sufficient to ensure operation that is reasonably consistent with the licensing objectives. Um, we've, we do agree actually on, on the comments that they've made there, we do agree with Gus Chalk's suggestion that the section should reiterate the statement in part 1.6. Um, so we therefore recommend that the opening sentence for 4.6 be added. So to the front, the council recognise that the prescribed mandatory and default conditions are usually sufficient to ensure that operation is reasonably consistent with the licensing objectives. Um, the existing opening sentence will then follow with further conditions may be applied to licences that are pro appropriate and proportionate to businesses and so on. So a minor amendment there. Um, uh, that's that for that point. I think that's it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.
Any further points on that to Alan on that uh, particular topic? No, have you now finished your presentation, Alan? You still got Sorry, I've still got a bit to go. <laughs> I've got 11 pages, we're on. Well, I'm not going to tell you what page we're on because that'll be. Double page two, are you? <laughs> no, no, no. Double it and you're at ballpark. Um, <laughs> the next one is, is betting premises, which is seven betting premises licenses, which is 7.6. And I think what Gostjork are referring to, as you can say, is gaming machines and betting machines. Um, now, what they appear to be referring to, we think, is self-serving bet betting terminals, but we haven't mentioned them in that paragraph. So basically, the difference between gaming machines, I think everybody knows what a gaming machine is, roulette, et cetera, potentially. In a betting shop environment, they can have up to four. With um, uh, self-service betting terminals, that's where there is a terminal, literally, where you can complete a bet in a similar way you could do at the counter. So it's an online version within a counter-based betting shop, if that makes sense. Um, now, that right in saying that we can't limit the number of gaming machines, that's four, uh, but they're also correct in saying that we could with service self-service betting terminals if we felt there was too many. Um, this kind of comes out, by the way, in it, it, the way we, we deal with this, it comes out in the inspection procedure because we'll go and inspect and then it's blatantly obvious to us that things might be in the wrong position, need better supervision effective. So that's where we can effectively look at this thing. Um, so <laughs> we agree with some of it, but we think there's a bit of confusion. So what, we've, what we're suggesting is that for clarity, we do agree that some of the paragraph could be reworded in two separate places. Firstly, the first line of the second paragraph, sorry, of 7.6, insert the word gaming between the words B2 and machines. So the beginning of the sentence reads, a betting premises license gives a holder an entitlement of up to category, uh, um, of up to four cat B2 gaming machines, also known as fixed stop betting terminals. That should eliminate any confusion. It says gaming machines. Secondly, we think that actually is a valid point they've raised. So we do recommend an additional bullet point within the first set of bullet points that you see there that add the number of self-service betting terminals are made available and their appropriate supervision by staff. So we will expect them to look upon that in the risk assessment, for example. So we feel that clarifies what we think is a confused element on the consultation. Um, Thank you. Have we any comments on uh, the recommendations? No, we seem to carry on, Alan. Thank you. Good news is we're moving on now. We've <laughs> gone on two pages and we're on to appendices E, e and F. As I explained earlier, they're identical. So pick which one you want to look through by all means. Um, I'm going to start with the foreword because uh, it's strong. Um, it's strongly worded by, by Popleston, Alan, and they say we strongly disagree with the commentary included in the draft policy draft as it does not appropriately identify the permissive regime envisioned by Parliament and implemented by the Gambling Act. Comments relating to child sexual exploitation and trafficking and the imposition of additional obligations conditions placed on the operator fail to consider the extensive social responsibility provisions now contained in the governing legislation. The authorities policy, as per the Act, should contain the principle that it proposes to apply in exercising its functions. It is therefore not an appropriate document to contain additional commentary, which is beyond the scope of the policy's function and it should be removed. It's kind of an overriding statement, but I'll respond to that. We disagree. <laughs> Section 349 of the Gambling Act states that the local authority shall prepare a statement of principles they propose to apply in exercising their functions under the Act. Part one of the GLA confirms that the Act provides for regulators discretion in managing local gambling provision, with licensing authorities taking the lead on regulated gambling locally. So it's clear we have to have something in our policy that represents a commentary of what we expect. And the local area risk assessments is a prime example of that as the tool that we use to be able to regulate. Um, so I, we don't agree that obviously providing that is beyond the scope of the policy. Appendix F of the policy, not Appendix F that we're looking at as part of the report, um, which is entitled Child Sexual Exploitation and Trafficking of Children and Young People, is a new addition and we accept that. 
but evidence from cases elsewhere suggests that safeguarding issues at gambling premises and or in the immediate vicinity have occurred. And after all, our view is that surely these issues are everybody's responsibility. Indeed, this forms part of the LA toolkit on the Gambling Commission website. Finally, we need to remember that one of the licensing objectives, after all, relates to protecting children and vulnerable people from harm by gambling. We believe, therefore, it's entirely relevant and proper that a reference to safeguarding in CSE is included in the local authority statement of policy. Um, moving on to, I don't know, I'll stop for questions there. It's not a recommendation, really, but if anyone's got any questions, Mr. Chairman. Any questions for Alan on that uh, subject? No, I see that. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Nearly there, page seven. Um, right, provisional statements. Um, Self-explanatory, explanatory really, what a provisional statement it is. We do, um, we do recommend that actually it does need updating. They pointed out needs updating following case law. It does, they're right. So what we propose, therefore, is to remove the last three lines of paragraph one, which we believe is the bit they've highlighted, i.e. that first bit, um, and to add the wording provided by them as stated in the consultation reply at the end of the paragraphs. Comments on that? Are we happy with that proposal? Yes? yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, next one's door supervisors. Um, they've, they've challenged it, as you can see. Um, they acknowledge there might be occasional need for premises to require door supervisors, but they're suggesting that it should, it should be amended and reworded to ensure this condition will be subject to the individual needs of the premises and imposed on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, we don't think as a one-liner, it does mean that we will insert conditions for the sake of it. But we do, however, recommend a tweaking of the wording to where premises may attract disorder, and this is the bit that's added, or previously identified disorder issues remain unresolved, or the premises is subject to attempts at unauthorised access, and then we'll just carry on with the, the, so it's kind of adding a bit that does imply that there have to be problems first before it will even be considered, which I think that clarifies anyway. Any comments on that point? OK, Alan. Thank you. Um, next point is 4.8, which is material amendments to premises. Um, it, it touches on what was a more controversial issue when the B2 machines were 50 to 100 quid a spin. They're now two pound a spin, as you know, through um, uh, the government actually bringing down the stakes. Uh, but it does refer to boothing around machines. Uh, that's supposed to be, obviously it makes sense. If you think of a betting shop and you've got machines in the betting shop, you want them to be supervised from the counter. Um, boothing, in our view, kind of makes that more risky because clearly you can't obviously see what's going on within a booth necessarily. Um, so in response to this, we relate to the fact that boothing of machines didn't exist when the act was drafted. So innovative approaches to delivering gambling facilities like this are developing whilst the legislation struggles to keep up. The Gambling Commission itself highlighted that the boothing of machines may potentially increase the risk of machine play. Uh, this was obviously a key issue, as I said before, the stakes of machines were significantly reduced. Um, we would therefore view this as a significant alteration to a premises, as it does have a direct impact on layout and supervision. Um, just for clarification, the Gambling Commission website states, whether amendments to a premises amount to a, a material change warranting an application to vary the premises license in accordance with the Act is a matter for local determination, i.e. us, and it is expected a common sense approach should be adopted. Um, experience tells us as officers from inspections that local area risk assessments are often not updated until we actually raise the issue. We therefore recommend that the matter stays in the policy but appreciate the committee may wish to decide whether or not boothing does or does not constitute a material change, also taking into account the cost to the operator of needing to vary the premises license and recognising these matters should be fully addressed in a risk assessment. So I think it's a straight choice of yes, we keep it in there, or no, we don't insist on a variation to a premises. 
Any comments on that one? Are we happy for it to remain as it is? Yes, Councillor Pierce. Sorry, Chairman, I'm just a little confused, that's all. Um, as, as to, well, from my point of view, it, it, it's including as many protections for people as possible, and I'm not quite sure which way, which, which option provides for that. Sorry. OK. No, that's OK. Um, the boothing of machines, we feel, uh, particularly when it was 50 to 100 pounds a spin, um, would, if you like, not the person playing that machine would not be as obviously supervisable, and that's not a word, but it's the best I can come up with, from somebody at the counter. So in the betting shop scenario, quite often you've got two people behind a counter that's got screens up. So we feel, that unless they've got a floor walker, that those two working on that particular time are going to be able to see everybody playing. If there's booting around a machine, that restricts the view to the playing of that machine. That's where we think the risk is. Yeah. I think the question is, I think that's right, but the question is whether we would make it a full variation for the, for the license holder. If we do, it would make them think twice about boothing, but the solicitors are arguing that as you wouldn't need to put boothing on a plan for the premises, and they're right, should that be a major variation? We think it impacts on the license objectives clearly because you can't see necessarily in a boothing environment. So we just decided to make it plain that if that happens, you need to make a full variation. I don't, I mean, I can bring Richard in if, if that would be helpful too, if that helps. If you've got anything else to add, Richard, thank you. Uh, yes, thank you, Alan. Um, the issue of boothing was a contentious one from the very start. And as Alan said, it was implemented initially when the stakes and uh, prizes were significantly higher on the B2 machines. Um, the, the, I have seen instances where it significantly compromised the ability of staff to actually supervise uh, the play of the gaming machines, uh, notwithstanding the fact that a significant number of betting premises are single man for a significant part of the day um, in, in the attempt to sort of reduce overheads and improve profitability. So there is a, an ongoing question as to whether or not uh, members of staff, uh, if it's a single member of staff, for example, can adequately supervise relatively sort of high stakes gaming machines or higher stakes gaming machines um, when they're surrounded by what they call privacy booths. Um, so I think it does present an additional risk. Yes, there is the argument that those machines can be switched off remotely and they can in most cases. However, it doesn't necessarily stop um, what I would call lower level harm taking place where someone could be gambling away their entire wages, um, not necessarily all in one go and therefore failed. This, this is failed to be picked up by members of staff in the in the premises itself. There is also the prospect and uh, Alan and I have seen this in a premises in, Sed in, in the Sedgemore area where one of these machines was located in such a place as to make physical physical observation of that machine extremely difficult as a result uh, and actually during the inspection of that premises we observed an elderly gentleman playing on the machine surrounded by a number of um, older teenage older teenagers obviously over 18 um, but the the members of staff for example in that premises did not know what was happening around that machine so for example without you know wishing to sort of over egg the risk one of the potential risks there for example would be that those youths were encouraging or um, persuading the elderly gentleman to spend money that he may not ha have so it is it is in in our view a significant risk if the premises implements changes that that change the risk profile of the premises. I think us as a licensing team, as an authority, would like to be engaged with that at the earliest possible opportunity. Thank you. Anything further for Richard? No, just thank you for that explanation. Okay, it's right. really helpful. Thank you. Can I can I ask Richard further? Um, is it has it has there been any challenge anywhere else um, to other authorities requiring? Full, a full variation? Has there been any challenge to that saying oh, it's, it's not needed, we don't have to do it? 
uh, I believe when the when when this was put in some statements of policy uh, three years ago, that similar challenges were made then. Um, but in terms of the outcome, I, I was involved in the development process, but not the not the the follow up to the consultation process. Um, in some of those uh, statements which I have uh, which I was involved in, that requirement has remained. Yes, even though a challenge was made. Happy Yeah, I, I think that gives us some good guidance to leave it in. Yeah. I would agree. <laughs> Any further comments on that, on that booze? No, no. So we're happy with your recommendation on that one, sir. Move thank, on. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, uh, Richard. Thanks very much. There's only two more, you'll be glad to know, so we're nearly there. Um, there's another comment, actually, you'll see from uh, uh, paragraph 4.17 general points regarding gaming machines uh, uh, disputing the bit where it says operators must undertake consultation with the licensing authority in advance of apply screening and or boothing to category B machines within licensed premises so it's touching on a different part of the same thing um, the policy we feel the policy does not require that plans include the location of every gaming machine we don't insist on that moreover it does require that they're adequately supervised proactive discussions regarding premises changes prior to the plans being submitted and in advance of any works are a very effective way of highlighting any potential issues quite often the operators actually particularly if they're independents value that because what we're doing is using an approach that has the potential to save them a lot of expenditure that may result in a premises no longer being compliant or compliance being compromised. Um, and the example is inadequate supervision. So we're actually proposing to help people here by saying, come to us and we'll tell you whether we think it's it's good or not and what you have to do. Um, there are instances, and Richard will agree to this, where <laughs> operators and some of them are independent some of them the bigger chains and we are dealing with a mixture of both here some of them will make a lot of changes and we'll go in and say no 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 and so they then have to revert back and it costs time and money so effectively if we engage with them first surely it gives them a pointer of where they need to go and could be more cost effective for them for that reason we recommend therefore that this requirement should remain in the policy any comments for Alan, on that point. OK, Alan. Thank you. Final straight. Um, we're now centering on Appendix F, which again we touched on earlier, child sexual exploitation and trafficking of children and young people. Um, I think they're trying to say that obviously, to summarise, they feel that, that, that it's already dealt with within the Gambling Act. Um, and they say that Paddy Power is a responsible operator and implements measures, which no doubt they, that they actually do, yes. Um, we don't agree, however, that it should be necessarily taken out or, or, or diluted. The addition of the appendix, as we've already said, is to raise awareness generally, as indeed you will know from what the work we do with taxi and private hire drivers, for example. Uh, we do not see, therefore, that it's unreasonable to ask any licensed operator to ensure that their staff are fully trained to recognise the signs of CSE and be signposted to the appropriate reporting channels, which is just as important. Um, there are many adult gaming centres and unlicensed family entertainment centre premises in Sedgemoor. Issues may occur immediately outside the premises. As occurred, as occurred, I understand, outside of premises in Sheffield, for example. So again, the awareness of staff through the provision of Appendix F, we think is relevant. Um, and I think what we've got to remember is it's not just about what goes inside, that's risk enough. They've got to be able to prove through their local area risk assessment that they plot all the risks outside. And sometimes these issues happen outside, and so the staff need to be able to recognise that if they become aware of it. Um, we do recognise that the author of this consultation response is a responsible operator, but they are a national organisation who probably incorporate a high level of training. There are, however, some independent operators who will find such so signposting as highly beneficial. Interestingly, some of the more generic LORAs do actually come from the national operators. So for that reason, we think it should stay in and remain unchanged. Thank you. And that's the last recommendation, Mr Chairman. <laughs> Thank you very much, Alan. Uh, any questions on that last point? 
that before I put it forward for recommendation of the amendments as proposed, are there any questions? And I therefore put it forward that we uh, adopt this policy as recommended with the various alterations. And could I have a proposer, please? Councillor Pierce and a seconder. <coughs> Councillor Julie Pack, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. And this is therefore I'll put it to the vote. Uh, all in favour? Against? Abstentions? Unanimous. Unanimous. Thank you very much indeed for that. Thank you for all the work, Alan, and to Richard for the work you put into this long document and for all of the problems you've had to face to sort out. And we appreciate it. It's a very long document and uh, <coughs> you must have spent many, many hours sorting this through. And uh, on behalf of the committee and uh, Sitch, well, we thank you very much indeed for all that you've done on it. Thank you so much. Thank you, members. Much appreciated. Thanks. Right, we move to item seven then. Uh, yes, members. Uh, this is just the usual reporting of the licensing panels that have taken place since the last committee, just for members to know. Happy to take any questions. Any, any questions on the report? No. Okay. Well, I think that uh, that concludes our meeting today. And may I thank all councillors for their comments and remarks on the meeting. And it's nice to see you all. <laughs> They're all big behind plastic screens and everything else. But it's good to see you all and thank you for coming and thank you for you know your proposals, which uh, are much appreciated. Thank you.